I will give you a look at some conversations and how they're shaping up in the India of today. And let me start with a simple uh, slide. Uh, this is a picture that many of you may instantly recognize. Yes? Yes? yes. Hardly anyone who would not relate to it. This is a still from the movie Titanic. Titanic. Yeah? yeah? And uh, as we all know, the Titanic sank on the 15th of April, 1912, in the icy waters of the North Atlantic. And uh, more than 1,500 people died. It was regarded as, it's regarded as the worst maritime peacetime disaster that we have seen in modern history. Uh, the ship that was unsinkable sank in less than three hours. Yeah? And it was a disaster that went on to become a movie from which I have taken the still. And the question I want to ask you all is why did the Titanic sink? Any answers? The iceberg? Any other reason? Any other reason? Was it the iceberg? Too much Can nothing go wrong? Oh, good. That's interesting and a very different answer. So the Titanic sank for many reasons. One of them is the iceberg that hit the Titanic and it broke apart. This is a much studied uh, subject. Why did the Titanic sink? And other reasons would be an Arabian captain who pushed it to the limits and moved faster and faster even before the engines were broken in. Of course, there are even other reasons, which is the lookouts were lousy. They weren't looking very well at what was on the outside. You could say the weather was bad, visibility was poor. Yeah? All of these reasons are good enough. But uh, several years ago, a uh, senior person from UNESCO asked the same question, why did the Titanic sink? And he gave a very different answer and a very different spin to the question. And he looked at it very differently. He said, yes, the iceberg was there. Yes, the captain was arrogant. Yes, the lookouts may have been lousy. But he said, all of these actually serve to confuse the situation. Even if the iceberg had not hit the Titanic, the Titanic was doomed. Even if it had landed safely, even if it had made the waves that it had set out to make, the Titanic was doomed for the simple reason that something else had happened 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, Kitty Hawk had happened. The airplane, the Wright brothers had invented the airplane. And the simple point that he was trying to make is that the size of the Titanic, the way it was built, the stories that were built around it was actually an overreaction to what was an existential threat. The story of shipping would change forever now that the airlines had come. No more would people take the planes, to the ships to sail across continents, they would be flying. All right? And his idea was that the overreaction that you saw in the design, which made it so difficult to navigate the iceberg, was really a larger theme that caused the disaster of the yeah, and this is known now very well as a Titanic fallacy. You could look at the event and say this event caused something to go wrong. But you could look at a theme that caused that event to happen in the first place. So are you looking at events or are you looking at themes? And in journalism, the field that I come from, we often talk of whether what you're looking at is episodic or thematic. The episode can tell you something, the theme can tell you something much longer. And I want to argue today, something of the Titanic fallacy has also happened to the kind of conversations we have amongst ourselves. And let me, let me tell you what kind of uh, scene we are immersed in when it comes to conversations. There are two types of conversations that we hear all the time. And one of them is simply the loud one. Have you heard of that? The screeching, the screaming, the punching of the fist, saying, here's my story, listen to it. And we've seen it in many a TV screen, and particularly one TV screen, if you know. Yeah? It's very loud. It demands your attention and says, my point is the point you want to listen to. Yeah? Is that right? We can all relate to it and we don't have to name it. Yeah? That's the kind of conversation that we hear. And the second one that we hear is a 30 second sound bite. It's slick, it's smart, it's sexy. It's supposed to be the way we are supposed to speak. You say it nice. Give a Twitter friendly headline. Have you heard that? Yeah? So that everybody gets what you want to say in a very short time. Okay? I want to argue that both of these have really taken away from us the very art of conversation and what we are doing and how we are understanding the world. Yeah, I'm going to draw probably the airs in three circles for you. So circle number one is this conversation that are loud, screeching, shouting, demanding your attention just like the Titanic did at one time. And the second one, the smart, the slick, the sexy, also demanding your attention in a very different way. Because this is all around you, you are immersed in it, you don't feel it anymore. And you feel this is the way conversations are meant to run. Okay? And the more you hear it, 
the more you are drawn to these and the more you are sucked into this kind of a cycle. When you see that happening and those people getting the attention, if you draw a second circle in their head, you think that is the way you are meant to speak. And therefore you learn to speak like that. Either you learn to shout, or you learn to screech, or you learn to scream, and then you say you demand your attention. So the language is what? Of the fist and the punch, hear me. If you don't like that and you have quite a time, then you say, I can't do well till I make it very smart. And I make that very smarty little sound by that and get away. So the more you see it, the more you do it. And the more you do it, you add to the universe of people who are talking like that. So circle one is growing. Circle two is getting more and more people drawn into it. And then comes the third circle. Because you're doing this all the time, because you're seeing it all the time, now you're listening to only people of this kind. And you've left out the whole set of people who are not shouting, who are not screeching, people that some of you in this audience. That's why I like coming to events like this. People who want to make some measured, reasonable points, but you have no space for them. You only have space because you've now told yourself that this is the voice that I want to hear. This is the sound that makes sense. If I don't do it, I'm not up to it. I can't come on the stage and speak because I neither shout nor scream, nor do I have the smart little sexy sound by that I can give you. I stammer, how can I come here and talk? And then I begin to listen to only those sounds, and when I listen to only those sounds, the rich tapestry, the 90% of the universe I have closed my eyes to. Just think about it, because how many people really shout or make talk and sound bites? People have ordinary conversations and ordinary relationships. And if I am tuned not to listen to them, then what is it that I am missing now? Is a question I want to ask you. This is a fallacy, this is a titanic fallacy on a titanic scale, if I can use that kind of a word. And I, 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 am, I, am, I am beginning to appreciate conversations of a different kind. Therefore, I like those people who are neither shouting nor listening, but who also stand up. Yeah, I think there was a first speaker here who spoke of how difficult it is sometimes to learn to speak. But I want you, I want more and more people to come up and talk. And I want to talk to those people who stand up, who are unglamorous, who can tell me about small everyday experiences that inform me of life and experiences in a very different way. And where is that art going to come if you're going to be immersed in circle one or circle two and miss out the entirely circle three, which is really more of those conversations and leaving out the rich tapestry? Let me give you an example of how this works. So um, I, I, I teach in a B school and uh, uh, a top ranked B school called the SPJ Institute of Management and Research. I'm a faculty member there. And one of the exciting programs we have there courses we have there, is every year participants go and mentor children living in the neighborhood but from underprivileged backgrounds. Okay, so we have every participant paired with one student, okay, a school student, who goes to Winsfield School probably, and they go to their homes, visit them and mentor them. And this is supposed to be a mentor-mentee relationship, but each teaches the other through experience. The MBA participant may teach maths to the child. The child is teaching life experiences to the MBA participant because you go to a household which is sometimes a slum, a tin shed, a patra, and see what kind of life is. That's also learning. Okay? So, <clears throat> so these MBA participants and the kids they enter have two different worlds. Okay? Often the participant in an MBA classroom would be a little more privileged, has come to a premier MBA program. And often the kid who is from the the background that's not very privileged has not seen that much of life or doesn't have opportunity. Till Geo came along, many of them didn't have internet on their phones. And our kids would you know, take their laptops in place of movies. All right? So one, some three years ago, um, the kids and the MBA participants went together on a picnic. This is supposed to be one of the programs where we do over Abhudya. The program is called Abhudya, we celebrate it. So I said I'll go on the paper on Sunday and I went along on that picnic. And, uh, here are some pictures from that picnic. And uh, I sat on the bus with them. They were eating normal tablas. I shared in that. Uh, in the morning, they were supposed to start at 6 o'clock. And the uh, young kids from the underprivileged backgrounds were on time. The MBA participants came one hour late. Okay. <laughs> and I waited for one hour for them to come, looking at a clock. Since we're not a classroom, so we couldn't tell them anything. And then we set out on our picnic. And we took some lovely pictures. And one of the things I did there, um, is to sit down. I said, let me talk to the kids who have come on this picnic because we rarely get to see them in a preschool. Our students go to their homes and mentor them, but we don't meet them. So it was a golden chance for me. Uh, these are some pictures from the picnic. You can see the lovely, bright faces. Yeah? See the energy. 
And uh, I sat down to talk to some of them. So after the play was done, and before lunch started, I took a, some six plastic chairs, requested the permission of the head of the program, allowed me to talk to some of them, and you know, set up a small little mini uh, area where we could talk and chat with them. And I asked them some very simple questions. Look at the, look at the smile, how warm that looks. Yeah? I can never forget this picture and that experience. And when I sat down with them, that's me talking to some of the kids on the table. And I said, let me ask them, what do they think of India? What do they think of growth? What do they think of life? Because these are questions I don't get to ask them. And our students are interacting with them. And uh, this lasted for about 20 minutes. I interviewed two sets of kids. Um, it was uh, probably a very important interview for a journalist like me, who has done interviews with all kinds of people, from the prime minister to the payment dweller. I think this was a very different experience. And would you believe it if I asked you, um, all of them said life is difficult. Of course it is difficult. Yeah, one of those, I, I can't forget, um, bright young kids, I asked him where does he stay? He said in the, in the, in the Khari of Varsova. And I didn't know what to make of it. And I said, so where do you go for toilet? He said in the bushes outside. And these were extremely bright people. Their eyes lit with hope. These are pre-selected for the program, so they are, they, are, they are very bright academically. They are willing to put in their hard work, but opportunities sometimes they them because uh, they just don't have those opportunities given the kind of social economic strata they come from. And uh, I asked them, where is India going? Is that a good question to ask these kids? You never ask these questions to these kids. And many of them told me, in fact, almost all of them told me that life is difficult. They have to strive and work very hard, but they have the resolve to go ahead and do the right thing. And then all of them told me, um, I don't think things are getting better. And they suggested that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Yeah. Uh, these are eye-opening comments for me. Uh, hearing it from the mouths of kids uh, who are very bright, that's me again. So SPJMR, you can see, is the name B school I work on. Growing together is the tagline of the program, the beauty I wish they do. And, uh, the kids were very animated, very engaged, very willing to talk. It's just that nobody really has spoken to them. And uh, the rich are getting richer, and the poor are getting poorer. And that's my impressive view. I asked myself, if I go back to the MBA classroom and ask them, how is it getting? Because we teach them economics. Of course, we teach them communications and all the smart skills of communications. I am one of those teachers. We also teach them sustainability, ethics, blah, blah, blah. But if you ask the MBA participants, what do you think of India? What, what answer do you think of they say India is growing. Yeah? We are 6%, 7%, pushing 8% GDP growth. Yeah? We are out to make our mark in the world. India is going to be a superpower. Opportunities galore. Everything is opening up. Look at the liberalized country and look at the opportunities that are thrown open. And sure enough, in less than two years, this kid would pass out from the MBA program and would be placed in large companies, large corporates, and would be earning lots of money. Yeah? Um, our placement reports will tell you that they do very well. And as they do very well, more participants come and come and learn on this journey with us. But placements become an important part. Because they have those opportunities, they see things in a different light. And the other guys who really don't have the opportunities see them in the future. Now, whose voice do you think is the real voice? Whose conversation is really giving us an indicator of what is happening? And I want to suggest to you here that Mumbai is a city of how many million people? 20 if you look at it, even pushing more if you, if you so 20, 24 maybe, yeah? If you look at some latest numbers. And would you know, and would you not believe, would you believe that 60% of those people live in the slums? Whose voice is more powerful? Those who say the rich are getting richer and poor are getting poorer? Or those who say India is pushing, we are a great superpower, opportunities beckon and there's opportunities every step. Yeah. Who are we listening to is an important question. Until we don't open our eyes and ears to sounds and voices and arguments and conversations that are coming from a wider range of people, we will be informed in a manner that is not really grounded, that is not really real. And therefore we will be working in a life, or working our life on assumptions that are not true. And Aldo Leopold in the mountains of Arizona was a hunter. And he was hunting wolves. And suddenly one evening he writes in a lovely book which has become the classic for uh, environmental reading, uh, Sand County Almanac. 
He said he saw wolves down there, a pack of wolves. And the moment you see wolves, you take out your guns and start shooting them. Okay, they shot at that pack of wolves. And he said, he and his friends, because when you saw wolves, you just shot, because the wolves were not supposed to be there. Yeah, they destroyed livestock, and you kill the wolves in the mountains. And he said, I reached just in time, but the, the, the wolves were down, and they were up. And when the wolf was injured, he said, I reached just in time to look into the dying eyes of the wolf. And those dying eyes spoke to me and told me, this is not the way it is supposed to be, that the wolf belongs to the mountain. And I then began to think like the mountain, because the wolf was not meant to be killed. But the point I want you to take away is that dying eyes of a wolf also had a voice that informed Alvin Leopold and built the classic color, Sam Country at night. When you begin to listen to those voices, that are genuine voices, you open yourself to a range of possibilities that are close to you otherwise. Yeah? You work in a very limited frame, and the journey is transformational. If the dying eyes of a wolf can speak to you, then the trees can speak to you, the wind can speak to you, your own soul can speak to you. Are you willing to listen? So when we do classes in listening, we say, please listen. But I also want you to ask yourself, who are you listening to? Are you listening to the loud? Are you listening to the smart? Are you listening to the real voice that is neither loud nor smart? What is the love to tell you? But the voice is hesitant. It is pregnant with possibility. Yeah? It's stammering. It doesn't want to come up. You have to enable it to come up. Because when it comes up, it informs you and takes you on a journey that can transform you forever. So when you go out of this meeting, try. Speak to those who have not spoken to you. Try to look for ideas in those places where you thought there were no ideas. And try to go away from the slip. Because don't buy that hand. Buy someone who really has an idea, but hasn't had the time to put it together in a slip sometime. And you'll be informed in a very different way. The journey is transformational. It will change forever. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much.